have you with us on the Ed Show tonight. This chart right here, I showed it to you last night. We'll start it out again tonight. This is everything you need to know about America. And I challenge any state representative or any senator of any state legislative body across America to come here and stand on this platform with me. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay your way to New York City. All you have to do is contact our producers and say that you want to be on the Ed Show and you want to explain to me in front of our audience tonight how this graph is good for America. And as for the top of the show, that was Ed Schultz, the round mound of sound over on MSNBC. And he was showing off a little chart that he loves to bring out on his show. It's a little chart that he thinks ends any sort of economic discussion when it comes to conservatives and Republicans. And in fact, OLED has gone so far in his show to say that he's challenged any Republican to show up and, and explain that chart and explain that graph. And he's even gone so far as to say that you know, he, he would uh, write a check and, and get a plane ticket and bring anybody up there who wanted to to explain that to him. Well, Ed, you can keep your, uh, you can keep your checkbook. You can uh, keep your plane ticket. I have no desire to go up to the hellhole that is New York City. But right here today, I, America's evil genius, will confront you on that little economic graph of yours. And I will show you how it's not an illustration of some kind of unfairness uh, in economics. But before we do that, Let's take a brief look and let's keep up with the America's Evil Genius World Tour. My upcoming dates and appearances. Okay, so you saw at the top montage of the show Ed Schultz talking about uh, his little chart and the difference between productivity and wages and how that's just proof that those evil conservative and evil Republican economic plans are just horrifically unfair. Well, I don't quite think so. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and throw that chart back up on the screen. I don't know if you got a chance to see, uh, see it in real detail when Ed was on the screen, so we'll put it up on our show here so you can see it. You'll see that there are three elements to this chart. This chart comes from Mother Jones, by the way. Three elements of this chart. There's a blue line that signifies wages, and you'll see that line's at the bottom of the graph, and it stays relatively unchanged between 1979 and 2009. There's a green line that signifies productivity. You'll notice that that line has uh, gone up at a pretty steady pace over that 30-year period. And there's a red line that signifies the average income of the top 1%. Now, for a moment, I want you to set aside that red line. We'll talk about it later, but what I want you to focus on is the green line for productivity and the blue line for wages. Now, Ed Schultz always points to those two lines. You see right around 1982, they started to, to move apart there, and they kept going further and further apart as the years went by. Well, Ed Schultz looks at that difference, and he says, that's the proof that something is drastically unfair with Republican economic policy, that production is going up and people are working harder than ever, but yet the wages aren't going up. And on a purely emotional basis, I suppose that if you just look at the chart and you don't really think any further into it, that you might buy into that. You might get a little angry when you see that. You might, uh, you might take it at face value. What Ed Schultz is doing right there is he, he's making a key mistake. This chart, or at least Ed's interpretation of it, is suffering from a glaringly false assumption. Ed Schultz is making the assumption with this chart that labor is always the key component or always a main component in an increase or decrease in productivity. Therefore, he believes that if that green line that shows the productivity goes up, if that line goes up, then the blue line that shows wages should go up right along with it. It should go up at right at the same pace, right? They should, they should almost be uh, cohesive to each other. Is that, is that really true? Does that really make sense? I'm not sure that it does, but yet Ed Schultz seems to think on a normal graph you would see wages go up right along with productivity. In other words, Ed Schultz is falling for something that we've talked about in this show several times, something that economist Thomas Sowell refers to as the mystique 
of labor. The overvaluing of labor in terms of the overall productivity process. We've talked about that before. But Ed Schultz is falling right into that trap. He's making the mistake of believing that labor is the only factor or the main factor or the key factor in productivity going up or down. But you see, there's another factor in this chart that Schultz isn't talking about, and I think it's a pretty compelling factor. He may be intentionally ignoring it. I don't know. But I think it's a factor that explains an awful lot of what you see here. Notice that around 1982, those, those lines started to move apart, right? They went further and further apart as you went along. Well, think back to the early 80s. What happened between the early 80s and now that might have increased productivity? Hmm. Now, those of you who are in your 50s or your 60s uh, and you were in the workforce back then, you probably have already thought of what this is. Some of you who are a little younger, you're my age, you're a little bit younger, it might take some, some explaining. But I want you to think this through. What could have happened in 1982 or thereabouts that drastically started to increase productivity for the workforce as a whole? It was technology. It was the advent of things like the personal computer, the internet, different ways of moving data over long distances in very short periods of time, even the fax machine when that was around or when that was popular, all of those technological elements combined to assist people in being far more productive than they'd ever been before. I'm going to give you just two examples here. You can think of a myriad of examples, but I'm just going to give you two examples of jobs where people are far more productive today than they were in 1982 because of technology. The first job we'll talk about is that of a secretary. Now I know, we don't really call them secretaries anymore. You're supposed to call them executive assistants or administrative assistants or whatever, but you know what I'm talking about. Secretaries, administrative assistants, executive assistants, whatever. Think back to a typical secretary's job in 1982, or even before, back in the 70s. 30 years, 35, 40 years ago, a secretary would have probably spent a lot of her time filing. She might spend a couple of hours a day filing, right? But a secretary in 2012 doesn't have to do that because a lot of the filing is done by computer. So you hit a couple of buttons, it's done in a few seconds. When was the last time you heard of a secretary being brought into a boss's office to take, take dictation? To, to sit there while he talked and write a letter out and then type that letter up and send it out. That almost never happens anymore. Why? Well, because we have email and bosses can fire off a little email real quick. Or if they need something more formal, they can have the secretary or the administrative assistant type it up on a word processing program, send it to them, they can edit it, and then they send it out. You don't need to spend all that time with dictation anymore. There's all kinds of things that secretaries do today that make them far more productive than they were 35, 40 years ago. And in fact, most companies don't even need to hire nearly as many secretaries as they did all that time back. Remember hearing about secretarial pools? You never hear of that anymore. Why? Because the secretaries, they've got a lower number of them, are far more productive than the larger numbers were years ago. Because of computers, because of technology, they can get far more done in an eight-hour day with less people than they ever could before. So that's why productivity goes up. But the wages stay stagnant or even go down because you're hiring fewer secretaries. I'll give you another example. The example of a call center. Think of the last time that you called the phone company or the gas company or the electric company maybe to pay your bill or report an outage or something like that. Dollars to donuts, the last time that you did that, you probably handled the entire transaction, the entire call with some sort of computerized system. You probably did not speak with a human being at any given point. Through the use of, of what they call IVRs or VR users, different ways you can do it. But you go through a menu system and most of the basic calls that come into a call center can now be handled without a human being ever speaking to you. Now I know some people don't really like that. They don't really like that process. But uh, for those in my generation and younger who are used to um, maybe paying a bill over the phone or even paying a bill online, uh, it's much nicer for us to be able to do it quickly and efficiently than to have to go through and, and sit there with someone and take longer and even have to wait on hold to get a, an operator. You don't have to do that anymore. So these call centers now can handle far more calls than they ever did before. They can take care of far more issues with people than they ever did before because they're allowed, allowing their most basic issues and their most mundane issues to be handled entirely by a computer system. That frees up their human operators to take care of more complex issues and more out of the ordinary issues. So therefore, the productivity of that call center is going up, but they're not having to hire additional people 
in order to make that productivity go up. The technology handles so much of it. Now, those are just two examples of many. You could, you could sit there for an hour and think of probably 20 different things, 20 different jobs where technology has increased productivity instead of labor. You know, because most of the increase in productivity is related to gains in technology, at least nowadays, the investments that produce that increased productivity are being allocated accordingly. In other words, you're not investing money in 10 secretaries. You're investing money in three or four computers for the three secretaries you've already got. And those three secretaries can be far more productive than the 10 secretaries could if they didn't have that technology. Now, some people are looking at that, and Ed Schultz is looking certainly at his chart and saying that's unfair, but is it really unfair? No, not at all. It's just a more reasonable allocation of the resources necessary to increase production in the most efficient ways possible. One of the most overlooked things in economics, one of the most misunderstood things, is that a lot of people think that labor competes only with other labor in the marketplace. That's not true. Labor certainly does compete with other labor, but it also competes with capital, which is to say that if capital can get a job done better or faster or more efficient than a human can, then the investor is going to invest in the capital and not the labor, aren't they? If that computer can do more than three people can do, I'm going to invest in the computer. If, if uh, there's a mandate that I have to pay bus drivers a certain salary, am I going to go right out and hire a bunch of bus drivers? Or am I going to look, hey, maybe I can invest in some bigger buses and have the drivers I've already got carry more people rather than investing in more people to drive the buses. As capital, specifically technology in this case, has done more recently to facilitate the increases in production than human labor has, it only makes sense that investment would fall into capital more so than it does into labor. And hence why that wage line is so flat. Because the technology over that 30 year period is contributing more and more to the increases in productivity, while the human labor is fairly flat in terms of its contributions. Wages, which are really nothing more than the cost of labor, and I know a lot of people don't like to think of that, but at its rudimentary, at, at its rudimentary best, that's exactly what wages are. Wages are the cost of labor. Those wages only rise if there is a scarcity of necessary labor needed for production. But today, this is largely not the case. In the short term, it would be ludicrous to expect wage increases when we already have 10% unemployment. In other words, there's already labor out there. Why would you pay more for it? But in the long term, it's ludicrous to expect wages to increase at a level similar to productivity during an era in which capital and technology are contributing far more to the increases in productivity than labor are. In other words, the productivity is going up, the wages are staying level, and Ed Schultz would tell you it's unfair, but I'm telling you, guess what? Technology is doing far more than it ever has. And technology is doing so much to increase that productivity while labor is playing roughly the same role that it always has. After all, we haven't legalized the 80 hour work week, have we? And, I, and I'm not saying we should, but I'm telling you it takes something like that to increase the contributions of labor to the point that it would be nearly as valuable as technology. Now, what about that red line that I told you to set aside, that line that showed uh, the average income of the top 1%? Isn't that unfair? Isn't that the proof of the unfairness of the system? No, I don't believe so. If the top earners are earning a significant amount of that income from investment rather than just selling their own labor, as uh, many others in the population are, if those at the top are earning their income at least partially or even mo mostly through investment, then it makes sense that their income for the 1% would rise at a somewhat consistent rate with a rise in productivity. After all, they're the ones investing in whatever it is that is making that productivity increase, whether that's a, a, an investment in labor or whether that's an investment in capital. Whatever they're investing in doesn't really matter because if productivity goes up because they've invested in it, then their returns are going to go up. Income is far more tied to an increase or decrease in productivity than the average wage earner is. We talked about it, we talked about it before. The average wage earner is not assuming very much of the risk in those products coming to market. If the wage earner goes in there and, and, and uh, works for 40 hours, they're going to get paid for 40 hours, whether that company sells anything or not. But the investor isn't going to get paid unless the company turns a profit.
So there you see Ed Schultz in his little chart that he thinks will end all arguments. Not so fast, my friend. Your chart does not prove any sort of unfairness. It doesn't prove any sort of flaws in the system. It just, instead, it just illustrates that labor is not as closely tied to productivity as it might have been in the past, or as some people even think that it is today. But Ed Schultz is trying to get you to think of this emotionally, not rationally. And for that matter, so is President Obama. They want you to look at a graph like that and say, that's unfair. But when you really think about it, it's not. So Ed, you can keep your checkbook and keep your plane ticket. I don't want to go up there to New York. But just rest assured that I'm on to you. The rest of us are on to you. You're lying to the American people. You're trying to convince them that that little graph of yours is an indicator of greed when instead it's an indicator of the natural order of the economy right now. Nothing more, nothing less. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.